That's weird. How can recording in progress? How can recording in progress be going on and the host is not yet? Yeah, what? I think I said yesterday. Yeah. That's us. Good morning. Give us a thumbs up if you can hear us, Zoom or people. Yay. We're having technical difficulties in the classroom. We can't get the TV to work. The internet's giving us issues. So we just turned on the, that's why we were late getting on. But as you can see, Elaine is here and we've got a room full of people that you can kind of see because of the owl, but they just can't see you. So we're gonna let Elaine get started in just a few minutes. See if there's anybody else that comes up the stairs or joins on Zoom. And for the people in the room, we this, have this is the owl, Terry and Charlotte Richardson, and Rad and Wendy and Janet Bryan are on Zoom. So you can see her, Kathy. Kathy, ma'am, introduce yourself because I bet everybody doesn't know who you are. And I'm Kathy Wingfield, the um, communications facilitator at First Press, and this is. Oh, the internet's good and bad. 
Kathy is a guru. <laughs> Who can't get the internet to do magic today. <clears throat> This is a little bit less intimidating than I thought. Good, I'm glad it's not as intimidating. I was expected to be totally intimidated. You see all the people up here. Although it's a whole. <laughs> That's what the zoomers see too. It's a it's a whole different thing than than having. Even if I could get the TV to connect, daily. this screen would be up there. Got it. This is a quiet group. <laughs> it is quiet. <laughs> This is the silent portion of the thing. We're all intimidated. We're all intimidated by the owl. That's exactly what it is. You guys wow. should you guys should move over here. So Elaine, so I can you. see you oh, better. Yes, otherwise, I feel like I'm, otherwise, I feel like I'm talking. I'm talking. I'm talking, I'm talking, I'm talking, I'm talking to the owl's your face back. so she can see everybody. Thank and that's what they see. Oh, oh yeah. And if the internet would cooperate, I could shoot this up on yeah, the TV we, screen. Yeah, yeah I've been here when we had it. When it worked. Before, yeah. I'm just going to ignore these <laughs> people. I'm just going <laughs> to. They can, they can chime hey there. in. They can chime in when they want to. Yeah, that's cool. Kathy. Yes, ma'am. Let people know about Daphne uh, Pope's death yesterday in case they haven't looked at their emails um, since yesterday afternoon. As Wendy just said, <laughs> Daphne Pope passed away yesterday after a few days in hospice. The arrangements have not been made yet. There will be another email coming from the church as soon as we know those arrangements. And if you have email, what we know is in the email that came out last night. Thank you. I should give it a little bit more time or what? I think you're good. I think we're good. This is it. We've got it. Okay. All right. Thank you all for coming and, and participating in this experiment with technology with here and there. Can we begin with a word of prayer? Dear Lord, we're thankful that you brought us all here today on this beautiful day and a chance to be together and be together in so many different ways that that technology provides for us. Lord, ever since the disciples asked you, Lord, teach us to pray. We've been trying to figure out effective ways to pray and communicate with you. Today, let us share with each other and find some new ideas and new ways of, of communicating with you, which is such a wonderful thing to be able to do and have a prayerful life with you in your name. Amen. Okay. Well, needless to say, the book that I'm going to review is called Learning to Pray. And it is written by um, a Jesuit priest who many of you probably have read, Father James Martin. And a little bit about his, his background, he is um, a Jesuit priest who is about, is about 60, and he uh, is editor-at-large of the Jesuit publication America magazine. Have any of you ever read excerpts from it or articles from it? I would encourage you to do so. I'm a, I'm a big fan of, of the magazine. It's, it's along the line of another publication that I enjoy following called Sojourners. And I think that America Magazine is very similar in terms of Sojourners, only Sojourners is probably a, um, a Protestant interpretation, whereas America is more of a Jesuit press communication, but they have far, far more in common than they do in terms of disparities. So Father Martin actually received his um, bachelor's degree in economics from the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School of Business in 1982. 
and spent some time in the corporate world. And like many being in the corporate world, and after viewing a, a documentary on Trappist monk Thomas Burton, he became more involved in the Catholic Church and entered into the Society of Jesus, more commonly known as the Jesuits, in August 1988. He is a member of the Labyrinth Theater Company and has consulted on movies. He appeared, in, he, he appeared as a priest performing two baptisms in Martin Scorsese's 219 film, the Irishman. He has written or edited more than a dozen books on religious and spiritual topics. He is a frequent commentator on national TV shows and talk shows. Reading articles from this magazine, plus listening to others talk about how much they admired his reading triggered me to read and report on this book. He is actually quite an entertainer. And I would encourage any of you to um, look up some of his YouTube videos. Some of the better ones that I found were one that was uh, from Boston College and where he talked about his book, The Jesuit's Guide to Practically Everything. <laughs> and the other one <clears throat> that, is, that, is worth, um, that is worth listening to is, uh, on, is Stephen Colbert. And he interviews him and, and, and uh, James Martin has actually been declared the official chaplain of the Colbert TV show. <laughs> so he is, he, is quite, he is quite an entertainer. And I said, I just, I, I, I didn't set out trying to start out this, this whole thing with a joke, but I was listening to his, some of his yesterday and I was sitting out there and I, you know, he really is, he really is laugh out loud funny. And one of the, the, the jokes he was talking about, because one of the things about this book, not only do you learn a little bit different perspective in terms of prayer, you also get a fair amount of, of Jesuit theology because you, he does talk a, a little, you know, some about that. But anyway, that one of the stories that he, he did on his YouTube video was he talks about the, a, a Franciscan priest dressed in dressed in all of his garb that Franciscans wear, comes into the barber and wants a haircut. And the barber says, you know what? You've taken a vial of poverty and let me, it's, it's on the house, Father, it's on the house. And the priest says, no, 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 I, I'm, I can still pay for my haircut. But the barber insists and he cuts his hair. The next day at the doorstep of the barber is a basket of flowers, thanking him for what he did for him. The next day, a Trappist monk arrives and the barber offers to do the same. You know, let me let me cut your hair, you know, for you. It's, it's on the house. I've read Father Tom Smerton and I admire what the Trappist monks do so much. And let me do this. And so the um, the barber cuts the tra Trappist monk's hair and he comes back um, the next morning and looks on his doorsteps and there's this gourmet box of, of cheese and, and um, wine and, and amazing things. So anyway, the next day, a Jesuit priest <laughs> comes to the doorstep of the barber. And again, the, the um, barber says, I like, you know, I admire the Jesuits so much. They're so intellectual and they, um, they do so much in terms of service and, and you know, their education system is second to none. Let me cut your hair for free. And so the Jesuit says, well, again, the same story, you know, I've got enough money for a haircut. I've taken a vow of poverty, but I still have money for a haircut. And so the, the barber does the same thing. And the next morning, the barber goes to his doorstep and what should he find? but 12 more Jesuit priests. <laughs> and it's, it's been said um, by, by many that the, the Jesuits are actually the Catholic Presbyterians. Now, somehow I got, I, last, last, last year I did this, I did a book on, on, on Jimmy Carter and um, who has always been one of, one of my heroes. And that was totally, on Zoom. 
So this is kind of a hybrid, I guess. But I have to, you know, I have to give you a disclosure, I think, about, about me that, that when it comes to reading, when it comes to books, I am really basically quite lazy. You know, one joining a book club is one of the best things I've ever done because I've it makes me read books and I have, and I have to do it. Um, and I need to be prodded. And this was one of the reasons why I said, well, I'm going to do, I'm going to do this book because it's going to encourage me to read this book. And, it, and, and that's exactly what it did. It's not, I'm not someone who's read all these books and then just goes to the shelf and picks out one to talk about. I'm one that says, I think I'm going to do this. And I'm going to read this book so I know what I'm doing. I did. I did. I did exactly the same. I did exactly the same thing in my professional life. I would say I need to know more about diabetes and pregnancy. Let's give a talk. And so and so I would. Um, I'm in in terms of my secular authors. I am not a heavyweight. I like Pat Conway, Roy, Jody Cult. So I'm not a real heavyweight. And as far as church readers, and authors and books, I have actually loved Will Willimon simply because of the fact that I find him a bit irreverent and funny, but yet um, presenting how faith can really go for the, for the common person. And that's exactly why I like this book. I feel like it is, it shows a way that somebody has an attainable faith. I found reading this book along these lines as being a fairly easy to read book. It was not complex in terms of a lot of theology that you didn't understand. And I was thinking about this and a few years back, there was a game called Othello. And the description of this book's book was a minute to learn and a lifetime to master. And I pretty much felt this way about this book. And I also think you can really extend this analogy to prayer that you can, you know, it, it should take a minute, a minute to learn but really it can be a lifetime to master. So what I'm gonna do is go through the book and read some of the chapters. Hopefully I can keep my papers in order here and not get, not get too confused. Um, go through the book, here's, here's the book. And I, I decided not to, to do audio visuals because- a what, little slow. So fast. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> And I'm going to read a couple of the, the, the chapters, some of the, the titles that they have, um, and they're all quite interesting. Um, everyone can pray, walking to school, childhood prayer, why pray, praying without knowing it, beginning a friendship with God, now I lay me down to sleep, which talks about rote and other formal prayers. I am here, the daily examine. How do I know it's God, discerning God's voice? The gift of imagination or Ignatian contemplation, praying with sacred te text, finding God at the center, which is uh, an entire chapter on centering prayer. And I know I, I didn't even begin to touch this one because Lloyd has done such a fabulous job in, term, in terms of taking care of that. Discovering God in creation, um, and now what? Moving from prayer to action. Each chapter is pretty complete within its within itself and probably could easily be used as a Bible study and you really could go out on a lot of on a lot of the topics that are there. As far as reading the book, um, it's it's not a novel and it's not one of those books where you say, well, I, you know, here I am, it's four o'clock in the morning, I'm up still reading this book. It's, it's, it, it, it's it, to me, it's, it's not one of those books where you have to say, well, I have to, I have to keep reading it. Um, it's more a book where you say, I, I, I found the best way to read this book was one or two chapters a day and, and then really kind of savor the, the chapter and think about what was in the chapter. So it's, it's that. Um, he is a great list maker, which, which I like, you know, okay. And, you know, and it, it, it is, it kind of, when you think about it, you think about, okay, this is, this is a bit of a how-to book. And if you're doing a how-to book, 
you simply must have lists. It's just, just it's just one of the requirements. But I, what I found about myself is when I, you know, of course, I looked over the, the, um, the chapters because, because another, another disclosure about myself, I sometimes tend not to read every word. I may skip to the end of the chapters. I may, I, I have all these guilty, uh, these guilty habits. But the one, when I looked at it, I looked at that, okay, what, what chapters am I going to highlight? Because obviously you can't spend time going over the entire book. So I looked at the ones and one of the ones I thought I'm really excited about discovering God in creation, because I've always felt like that that's one of the best ways to, to go and praise, discover God in creation. And we're going to talk about that. But then there were some that I thought, oh, well, I mean, these are just too, these, these are too Catholic. You know, the daily examine, you know, what in the world is the daily exam. Um, praying with sacred texts. You know, I thought this was, this surely must be limited to someone who has an advanced theology degree. <laughs> and then the gift of imagination. And I thought I would really like this topic, but I had really no idea where it was going to take me. I think the, the, the basic question you you know you want answered from this is you know what is prayer and it's it's a pretty simple answer that comes from this but being a personal question for everyone but simply put it is communication with with God a theme that comes through in the book is that everyone can talk about God but it's much harder to talk with God it's a very big difference between those between those two words I would say my prayer and my concept of prayer used to kind of center along the lines of Anne Lamont, who in her book is help, thanks, well. That help being the help being the petitionary prayer, thanks being the prayer of gratitude, and wow, discovering God and creation. What this book did was take me beyond um, beyond these concepts and show me that prayer could be found in many other places, many of which we never even think of as praying. Because, you know, we always kind of think of praying as, as the very, you know, dear Lord, dear Father in heaven. And then you talk about the people that, are, you talk about the people that are sick. You talk about what you want for the world. Um, and you ask for the blessings. That's pretty simple. But I, so that's kind of the way I probably had approached prayer before. I didn't think that there was a lot of different ways that prayer could occur in our life. So I found out that it really was so much more. I'd like to start with the introduction. And one of the things he talks about is why believers don't pray it um you know obviously it's one thing where you can say well you know if someone is a non-believer you know probably we understand why they don't pray but the 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 question was why believers don't pray and these are the some of the thoughts that he had on this they've been told that they're praying wrong they weren't taught they didn't grow up in a family who had prayer on a regular basis Here's one. They consider prayer something for holy people, not them. They've never been encouraged to think about what they already do is prayer. Sometimes people find prayer boring. They don't see the point when God already knows what they're thinking. And I think that's a, that's a common one. They're too busy. You know, I, you know, like, well, I've got so much to do and, and I, I don't have time for prayer or they don't make the time of it. They're lazy. They fear change. They fear that God might answer their prayers or tell them to do something that they don't want to do. 
And one of the things that he, and I'm not gonna do it in this classroom, but I'm gonna ask you to just do it, do it in your mind. He, on some of his workshops in prayer, and this is the, the chapter on praying without knowing it. He starts with an exercise and he um, looks at his audience and he says, um, and everybody calls, has their eyes closed. He says, first I say, raise your hand if you pray. Usually most people raise their hands. Next I say, now keep your hand up if you pray on a regular basis. Half will keep their hands up. Then I ask everyone to put their hands down. Finally, I say, now raise your hand if you're happy with your prayer life. In response, only a handful of people raise their hands. Now I say, keep your hands up if you think you pray well. Most hands will go down. Perhaps only one or two will remain. Why so few? Does this mean that most people aren't praying well? Not at all. Rather, it shows that many people think that they are not praying the way they should. So I thought that was an interesting thing. Now, one of the things he talks about is, and this is where I started to think about, you know, prayer being more than just the what we what we hear in church and what we hear um, in more of a rote prayer. Um, that we are probably, in many ways, praying without knowing it. And these are some of the ways that he lists that that prayer is not always found in the, in the traditional. Common times of praying aware, unaware. You spontaneously ask God for help. And maybe snail simping is something of, of you know, Lord help that person that, that just, I see an accident. You know, drive by, you know, what you call drive by prayers. You know, Lord help me find my keys. I've lost them once again. You know, spontaneous, spontaneous prayers. You pause to think about something that inspires you. You're aware that you feel compassion. You feel sorry for someone that's undergoing a lot of difficulty in their life. You wonder about God, which is, you would never think of that as a form of prayer, but you're wondering about God. You wonder if God approves of your actions. I think this is Catholic. You wonder about the meaning of your life. You are aware that you are grateful. <coughs> you try to center or connect. And you wish you could pray. You may be in a church for a wedding or funeral or see someone kneeling in a pew and feel a sudden longing. You have a desire for prayer itself and wonder what it would be like. This can be the beginning of prayer if you can allow it to be. The next book, chapter I want to talk about is chapter six, which is beginning a friendship with God. And this does a lot of comparison between friendship with others, you know, dear friends that we, we keep a friendship with and having taking some of the same um, characteristics of that, some of the, the same techniques you do to keep a friendship alive and using the same with God. And um, I think this, this, made, this made a lot of sense to me. And, they, and one, of, one of his mentors, and he actually dedicates the book to him is Father Barry, who also does a lot of writings. And he does a lot on the importance of the friendship with God. And, you know, you think about one of the things we talked a little bit about was time in terms of, of dedication to God and taking time to pray. But we all know that if you don't take time and spend it with your friends, things start happening to that friendship that you need to take the time. And sometimes you have to make, you have to say, I'm going to have to make some time to, to be with, to be with my friend. And so one of the things I suggested to do, you know, in terms of, of developing a friendship with God is think about what you do. What are some of the steps? He lists some of the characteristics of friendship, including honesty and vulnerability, listening, ability to express true feelings, 
change in growth, and the ability to feel friendship in silence. I used to always, you know, think about I, I, my best friends. I would describe as, I, you know, I, I described them as refrigerator friends, that you could probably go over to their house and go to the refrigerator without asking. <laughs> <laughs> and the other was was middle of the night friends, the people that you could call in the middle of the night and say, you know, you know, I'm really, you know having a hard time, you know, those middle of the night friends. Now you probably would text them first in the middle of the night. So things, things have changed just a little bit about. Um, the, the, the friendship in silence, you know, you always see, um, you know, you always see couples that have been together for so long and it's, you know, they've said almost everything they need to say, but there's a friendship in the silence. And when I was doing this, I thought about that, that, um, in many ways, we all had different feelings about the pandemic, but there was part of it that I thought was really very much a spiritual experience in the fact that we were given forced time. You know, that I could, um, I could take my book, take my prayer and go sit out on my deck, sit in nature. And um, I didn't, I, I couldn't go anywhere. So I, I, I didn't have that excuse. And I can always, I can already feel myself kind of slipping, slipping back in, into, into my old ways. Um, you know, I think we did a lot of things. We did, you know, some of us did, you know, we did writing, we did praying. We, um, a lot of people reconnected with friendships that they had, had let go because, you know, what else were we going to do? You know, there were only so many, you know, there's so many, so many binge TV shows you can watch. And, you know, people started communicating with members of their family, uh, a lot of college friends and, you know, high school friends did Zoom calls and got back together again. So it was, it was something that I think was a very, very spiritual time. And part of that being the silence and that being one of the hardest things that I think in terms of maintaining. Um, one of the questions they asked if you pray and and we're going to get a little bit more into this the the importance of of not just praying but actually action um and if friendship was only asking for things what kind of a friendship would that be and if you pray for a friend who's lonely and never visit them what kind of a friendship is that now, what you want to do is take these steps about friendship and apply them to your relationship with God. But however, like many friendships that we may ignore, God is always waiting for us to come back and restore our friendship. It's weird not being able to talk back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> I keep, I, keep, I keep wanting to ask, what do you think about that? What do you want to <laughs> What do you think about that? The next chapter, like I said, um, that that really surprised me in terms of what chapter I was going to like, was called the Daily Examine. And it is a Jesuit, <laughs> Jesuit term in, in, in exercises on spirituality. And it is spelled, luckily, um, E-X-A-M-E-N, but it is pronounced like you would pronounce, I'm going to examine your foot. And uh, so that, that's, that's the way it's pronounced. And he starts out about this talking about, um, about a theater workshop that, that he took. Because like I said, he's, 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 he's really a bit of a performer and a bit of a thespian. And, but he took a theater workshop. And one of the things they did was not just reading the passage, but starting to envision yourself actually there and being part of the, being part of the scene rather than... And, rather than just what seemed to be happening at face value. But that's really what, what an examine is. And it is the importance of being conscious about what's going on around us and notice that God is present in everyday ways. The prayer or the examine is essentially a review of the day in God's presence. People are often surprised when they look back and see how God was present in their daily lives. As opposed to just writing your thoughts in a diary, this should be God-centered. 
Overall, the purpose of the exam is to get us to notice God. And five steps being presence, gratitude, review, sorrow, and grace. And one of the things that he did in his book was he took um, a college student and wrote what, you know, he, he said this was actually a compilation of talking to several, you know, a number of college students about their daily lives. And this would be an example of what their daily exam would be. Okay, God, here I am. Please help me in my exam. What happened when I woke up this morning? Hmm, I was tired from staying out so late last night, but happy I didn't oversleep. Guess I should thank God for that. <laughs> Breakfast was grim. A cold slice of that leftover pizza. Maybe I should take better care of myself. I remember that homily from a mass a few weeks ago. Was that last week or the week before? Let's see. Two weeks before ago, I was at that party and met that girl. Oh, yeah, it was last Sunday. The, <laughs> the priest talked about reverencing your body, like reverence you other things in life. I like that idea, as if your body is something holy to be taken care of. Maybe less pizza and more fruit or something. <laughs> This morning was crazy. I was late to my English literature class, but I was glad that I finished that paper in time. I got a lot out of that book, too. I didn't think I'd like Jane Austen, but she has a good sense of human nature. Where did I see that movie based on that book? Did I go out with my girlfriend, or was that before we started to go out? Maybe that's when I was with, oh, I'm getting distracted. Yeah. yeah, and it was funny before class when my friend kept teasing me about getting my paper in on time. He's a great guy. I'm happy we met freshman year. Wow, we've been friends for two years now. I'm really grateful for his friendship. And I guess I never prayed about that before. Maybe I should tell it. Nah, maybe not now, but at least I can be thankful for it. Thank God we didn't get too much reading for the weekend from that theology class. The professor is great giving me that extension a few weeks ago. It's awesome when people go out of their way to be kind. That's something I don't appreciate as much as I could. People just being nice, kind. Thank you, God. Lots of people in my life are nice to me like that for no reason. My mom sent me that care package of cookies the other day, even though she was busy. My grandma sent me a card with $50 in it and my resident advisor who told me what courses to sign up for. And she was right. It's wonderful to have those people in my life who are so kind. Maybe I should be more thankful about that. The woman who works in campus, campus ministry, what's her name anyway, <laughs> told me to think about being attracted to kindness as a kind of call. Like it's kind of a call from God for me to be nicer. I guess I could be nicer to my mom and dad. Last time I talked with them, I was short with them since I had that paper due. Sometimes I forget all that they try to do and how happy they are that I'm even in college. Someone once told me that I'm, if I'm ever mad at my parents, I should think about the things they did for me when I was a baby. Things I don't even know about. Lunch was a blur, basically, I can't even remember it. Yeah, I dropped, grabbed a hot dog and a soda on the way to my next class at 1.30. Economics drives me crazy. I don't seem to be able to get the hang of it. And I guess I was in a bad mood when Rob asked if I could give him my notes from the last class. Maybe he should have give, given them to him right away instead of making him practically beg for them. I can get mean when I'm in a bad mood. I guess I didn't <clears throat> respond to God's invitation to be generous. I'll have to think about that. <laughs> Class didn't turn out so bad anyway, and I think I'll be able to do okay on the test, I hope. How about a little help with that, God? Am I allowed to ask for that? Maybe I need to be more positive about things. I'm grateful that I had a chance to grab a nap after the gym and before dinner. I feel healthy. Sometimes I take my health for granted, but I'm 19 and in decent shape, and I know a few people in my dorm who have health problems. Dinner was awesome. It was fun to spend it with my girlfriend. I'm so lucky to have such a great girlfriend. She gets me to laugh at everything, even myself. And man, that vegetarian lasagna in the cafeteria is amazing. Can't believe I had two helpings. Maybe I should work out more tomorrow. I probably should have studied more after dinner too instead of surfing the web and looking at porn too. That always gets me down. Why do I do that? I have my girlfriend. What do I need that for? Also, I was glad to find this quiet study carol in the library, and at least I got through what I needed to cover tonight. Anyway, it's 12.30 a.m. now. It's been a pretty good day. Thank you, God. Get me through tomorrow. <laughs> Which, you know, it, I I enjoy this because it's, it's basically saying at the end of your day, and we're going to get into this in a minute, um, at the end of your day, you kind of say, okay, this is what happened, and how did I see God in 
those daily things. And I, every, every, I, I, I'm, I'm tabling this. Maybe I'm not going to table it all the way to Lent, but, but um, every, every year for Lent, um, I try to do something that's, that's positive. And so I think maybe, maybe for next, next year's Lent, I might focus on doing a daily exam. Now, this is the end of the day. And it talks a little bit about that. It says, why pray the exam? Um, the exam is an antidote. When you pray the exam at the end of your difficult day, you will be reminded of that moment of grace. Remember to be thankful for your friend's embrace. Perhaps remember other times with your friend. You will be grateful to God. You will be grateful for your friend. And you may see your day more joyful than you had initially thought. Finally, you may experience relief when you realize all these things. My life is not so bad after all. And he does talk a little bit about distractions. And, you know, one of the things I thought was the most common question being, what if I always fall asleep? (laughs) (laughs) What if it feels like I'm racing through a boring list of what I did today? What if I don't feel anything when I pray it? What if my life isn't going well and I just get sad thinking about my day? And he gives answers to all these. And what if I'm not sure how it's supposed to change me? But I thought it was, I thought the exam was an absolutely fascinating concept that, that I had never even, even thought about as being prayer. Now, um, the gift of imagination. And um, this another name for this is 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 Ignatian contemplation, and we're going to do a little exercise on this one. And um, what this is is um, trying to use your imagination to place yourself in a scene from the Bible, and then paying attention to what came up in prayer you're going to compose the place. You're going to think about where you are. You are going to focus on what you're seeing. You're going to look at the surroundings. What does the physical setting seem like? What do the people look like? What are they wearing? What are the expressions on their faces? What do I hear? What do I taste? What do I smell? And just let your mind wonder. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to read and ask you to close your eyes. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands on anything. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm going to read a very, um, you know, a passage, a passage of, that we all know, and I want you to imagine what it's like being there, what you're hearing, what you're seeing, what you're smelling, what you're tasting, use your senses, and and, and just think about being there. You're, you're gonna just use your imagination. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David. He was there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks by night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill to men. Okay, you see it a little differently when you're Focusing, you know, I think, you know, obviously, if you're thinking about the this, this, this stable, you're, you're focusing on, um, 
you know, what it, what it probably didn't smell so hot. Probably didn't, it, it didn't, probably was hot, probably was uncomfortable. Bed was probably not the most comfortable thing in the world. Obviously, you know, doing, doing what I do for a living, I was probably thinking about the, 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 the sounds of birth, the difficulties of birth, the smells of birth and all of these things. But I think it's an interesting way of approaching a text. And I never thought of that as praying, but, but indeed, Indeed it is. Now the next one, which was the one I thought was chapter 15, I thought um, I'm, this, is, this is the one I'm gonna like. And I did like it, but I, I, was, I was, you know, I felt like I was set up. This is the one, this was the one I was, this was the one I was gonna like. And this is discovering God in creation. And um, I've always been a, a big believer in this. We have a, um, I have cousins that um, live in California and they have a, a camp, uh, a covenant church camp called Mission Springs and it's out in the Santa Cruz mountains. And it's, um, they have, have services in what they call Mission Grove and you go out and there's this beautiful, they've got beautiful redwood trees and, and it's there. And I can, I can very much remember one of the ministers at one point saying, he said, you know, open your eyes. You know, everybody, you know, you, everybody, says, let's pray. It's just like, shut your eyes. This is, he says, open your eyes. I want you to look around and look at the creation. And, and, and that's the way we're going to do their prayers. And that's always, that's always stuck with me that, that, um, you know, that, that's, that's sometimes, you know, it's, and especially if you're by your, if you're by yourself to just, you just, talk to God and, and, and look at, look at the tree, look at the, look at the water rather than, than closing yourself, but rather you're, what you're really doing is, is um, exposing yourself to the entire universe of creation. I think um, one of the things, you know, in terms that, that he, Father Martin does talk a little, quite a bit about is the impact that, that Pope Francis has had on how we have come to um, value the environment, because that's really been one of his been one of his main major focuses that that um, that we need to be thinking about how important it is in terms of, of nature and how one of the things that that he said he used his imagination on was how um, Jesus enjoyed being out in nature. Because there's really not a whole lot on you. You do, you know, you think about it, you. You know, you kind of imagine. You know, we've we've seen a lot of artwork on it. You know, Jesus being out in in terms of being with with the uh, the beasts and the animals and everything. But you know, there's not a whole lot biblically. But but using your imagination to um, see what it was like for Jesus in creation and how it can be like that for us in creation. And some of the ways they talk about, he talks about using nature is letting nature calm or delight you. Enjoy nature as God's creation. Consider image, consider nature as an image of God. And learn about the wonders of nature. You know, read that read that bird book, read that book on the national parks and learn how um, God can be taught in nature. And let nature teach you about God. And one of the most important things being reverence and care for nature that Pope Francis's encyclical may be the most comprehensive approach to the call to reverence creation and care for it. And ne the next chapter I found interesting was um, was was talking about prayer, and um, wait, I'm sorry, just a minute. There are topics in prayer, and this is I have to keep an eye on my time. Right, this is distractions in prayer, and if and if 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 I had been on um, his editorial board. Um, which I was not asked to be. Um, <laughs> I would have, I would have called this stumbling blocks, stumbling blocks to prayer. And uh, he talks about distractions to prayer, and then he, the other other um, 
thing he talks about is despair in prayer, which is obviously much, much more serious in terms of, a, of, a, of dealing with it. But distractions, that being one of the first one, the types of distractions, and talking about handling distractions. And, you know, you know, we all know this, you know, you, you think about this and, and your mind goes elsewhere. But sometimes I think when your mind goes elsewhere, maybe, maybe that's God kind of taking us to that other, to that other area, you know, wasn't kind of the way we, we, we wanted to go just like, again, a conversation with a friend, you know, and you find yourself in, you know, how often have you said, now, what was I talking about? <laughs> because, because, uh, because the distraction has taken you somewhere else, but how to handle distractions in prayers. First, don't get angry at yourself. It's nothing that you did is human and natural to encounter distractions. Second, let go of whatever you can and don't worry about what you can't let go of. One of the things he said about, which seems like almost counterintuitive, learn how to pray when you're distracted. You know, learn how to learn how to turn it around. And another one he talked about is dryness in prayer. The second most common complaint about prayer is nothing happens. This is often referred to as dryness. I close my eyes and nothing seems to happen. I don't feel anything when I read this passage from the Bible. Sort of dry. But then he talks about dryness as being a little bit a, a deeper level. That, um, And he talks about darkness and dryness and desolation and doubt, disbelief, depression, and despair. And those, like I said, those to me were all much, much, much heavier topics and um, um, really involved a lot of thought and a lot of thinking. The final chapter that, and I've kind of gone through an, an, a little bit of an evolution on this final chapter. The final chapter is called, Now What? And, you know, I think I'm kind of like a, a you know, I'm like the 4th of July fireworks when it comes to a book. You know, I kind of want that, I want that grand finale. You know, I want him to come along and say, you know, this is, this is how you do it. This, you know, I want to leave inspired. And I, I didn't, when I first read this chapter, I just didn't feel that way at all. I felt like it was kind of a little bit anticlimactic. You know, I thought, well, okay, this is, you're saying a few things here, but I'm, I'm you know, all the others I really, really liked. But then it, I started, again, it was one of those, my mind card start, started carrying me to different places. Um, and the real point of the last one is moving from prayer to action. And some of the things he says is prayer is not simply to help us feel good about ourselves or close to God. It should move us to action. It the surest sign of prayer's genuineness, says Joyce Rupp, who is a who is a writer, is when it influences what we say and do. And then he goes on to say, I don't mean to suggest that after every prayer, we have to do something. But over time, prayer should move us to act. It's not simply about our relationship with God. It also has to do with the relationship between us and our fellow human beings, our fellow creatures, and the rest of creation. So I think what I was waiting for was for him to give me all the answers. And I think what the last chapter is, the last chapter says to me is I've given you all these tools and you better figure out the action yourself. You know, that I'm not going to give you, <clears throat> I'm not going to give you a list of what you are supposed to be doing in terms of your action. And um, I think I could not have, planned this better because um, how many of you are in early service? Some of you still go, but one of the, one of the things that, that I really found from the sermon today, it was just like, it was just like, okay, 
prayer is act, prayer is action is 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 when von Fernell listed all the things and how the church had responded to Florence and all the different ways that, that we have to respond to action rather than than just saying you know the idea again of saying well I I I'm going to put all these people on my prayer list but you know what I'm probably not going to, I'm, I put them on my prayer list. Therefore I've done what I need to do, but you know, that the prayer should be something that really says us to action. And, and I, and I've, I know I felt that way, you know, I, you know, I sit there in my nature and I, and I pray and I think, Oh, okay. Now, okay. I've got, now I've got this on my mind. I've got it. I've got to do something about that. And that's, and that's the, that's, that's, that's the call to action. Um, so, like I said, I started out not liking this last chapter, feeling it was quite anticlimactic and it didn't give me enough lists, it didn't give me enough ideas. And this is what I wrote to begin with before I started thinking about it. The rest of the book is so detailed and so practical, I'm willing to overlook this last chapter. I cried. <laughs> I tried not to read reviews before I finished reading, but it was interesting to see what other reviewers had thought similar to mine as far as the practicality of his lists, looking into topics such as the examine in detail, loving his humor, his life examples, and simplicity in writing, which truly makes it a guide for everyone. So, do we have questions? Do we just stop? <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? Go ahead. <laughs> they don't hear them. I do. Now, has, has he written a lot of other books? He's written about, I think, 10 to 12. Let, wow. I'm, let me see. Um, at, at least, probably. Uh, at least. He's fill, he fills up a page yeah. of books he's written. And then he obviously writes editorials for the America magazine as well. Elaine? Yes. It's, it's Wendy. Um, oh. Probably before you came, um, we did a quarter or maybe even two quarters of Sunday school on um, that book, Jesus, A Pilgrimage, which hey. was his first books and of all his books that I've read, uh, I haven't read the prayer one yet, but of all the books that I've read of his, that one is far and away um, my favorite of, of his books. Uh, but that was about 10 years ago. I think we did that Sunday school class. Uh, have you, is it, have you heard him speak? It's on video. Yeah, I, I, he's quite, like I said, he's, I think he's, quite entertaining in and 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 you know in, in his in his presentations yes Helen so it was um <clears throat> interesting after I read that you were going to be discussing his book to hear a comment of his in the last couple of weeks uh in response to this um <clears throat> this little issue that's been going on among the Catholic bishops about whether to chastise uh, right. Biden. Um, right. And I found uh, Father Martin's uh, comment about that um, uh, thought provoking and interesting. And I think it was something to the effect of <clears throat> well, are we going to make a list of all the people that haven't? protected life in other ways right <clears throat> exactly keep them from community so it, anyway i thought it was interesting that he's involved in public discourse yes uh, with the catholic church yes very well very... that works for him but maybe he has enough right. uh, cred that he can do that i know i think i must have heard that too the same thing on you know he says i'm i'm, I'm I, you know i'm pro-life but i'm pro um you know people getting enough food people you know right. you know you know doing enough for others but uh, yeah I, I i really like the way he thinks i mean i like I, and he was pushing back against the bishops and, and seemed to get by with that so, yes yeah. yes i mean I, I i don't think there's you know he definitely has a you know there's definitely a he's definitely mm -hmm. on that wing of the of the of the catholic church but but i think it's it's there's a lot of things here that that we all can learn from this you know that it's he's 
wonderful theologian and and I like his I like his his practical aspects is that's really what <laughs> what attracted to me it wasn't this was not way over my head you know and I could come up with some really good of saying okay how am I going to apply this to day-to-day -day life and, and, and just one other comment you're uh, leading us on that little exercise about putting ourselves into a story in scripture and looking and imagining what we could see and smell and hear that was very helpful I like that a lot. I like that I like that exercise too that you know you could you could you see you see yourself there's and there's so many scenes in the bible where you think I mean think about think about the the what it was like you know 40 days in the desert you know how it must have smelled and and you know all those animals and 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 the heat and just the, the physical aspects that we don't we don't always feel and then and then praying on praying on a on a passage i thought with this the sacred text was very in, you know i didn't really go into that but but you know basically taking a passage and then and then praying on that and letting your imagination take you where you need to be with that I really enjoyed the, the examine, and I think that's something that I would enjoy doing. I do too. Um, that was like a stream of consciousness coming out. This right. Man. Right. Right. And, and um, looking back at the at what you've done at the end of the day, reflecting right. on that would be. Janet, I might be interested in doing that. Mm -hmm. Janet was just saying how much she enjoyed the thought that process of the examine at the end of the day kind of looking at at what what you've been doing and how it all how it all fits in and then how God has been active in your life and you didn't even know it I think sometimes that you it see God in retrospect better. okay you see God in retrospect in your life right quite often you go through it you don't see that at the time but when you look back you go you see the hand of God working in right your life right right that examine is a short term version of that. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. I think I may need to do it at 730. Or in my or in my or it might be just it 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 uh, otherwise I might fall asleep. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Elaine. Um, next week is Stacy Griffith, and she's doing Jesus Through Middle Eastern Eyes by Kenneth Bailey. Not next We're week. We're off next, oh, next, next week. Oh, the next week. The next week. Um, help us examine how Jesus would have seen and conveyed the teachings he shared with his disciples and others. It is not a reflection on the current Middle Eastern political cultural situation. Brother Bailey allows us to hear Jesus' words reflecting his culture of the day is spoken in Aramaic. He reveals quite a bit of nuance to stories we think we know so well and allows us to see them through a different lens, the one Jesus would have used. And she says, see you soon, Stacy. And again, we are not meeting Sunday school next week, but we will have um, a new preacher next week. We'll be here and there will be a reception after both services if you so choose to attend. Yay. Okay. It's exciting next week. And again, thank you, Elaine. You're welcome. Hope everyone has a good day. Thank you all, everybody online. Have a great day. See you later. <laughs> <laughs>